We're going to do the show and tell next. I see a fair number of robots around, so who wants to go first? My name's James Bowman. I'm a developer with, um, with Willow Garage. Uh, we've got a few things to show tonight. Um, but just quickly, I wanted to um, uh, give this an outing. It's an Arduino with um, an Ethernet board, uh, which is plugged into a um, ROS master running on this laptop here, which is up on the screen. Um, and what is running on the Arduino is enough code to talk to ROS. So ROS is a robot operating system. It's a message passing system. So what we've got here is a single node running on the Arduino, which is uh, receiving messages from ROS. There's a, there's a process, a Python script running on the laptop here, which is blinking this LED. And at the same time, it's passing messages back to the um, ROS master running on the laptop. This is what uh, those numbers are. It's just reading noise off its analog pins. So we've got messages going from this node to the ROS master and from the ROS master into the um, small node that's running here. So it's the beginning of, um, of something, right? You could imagine having uh, your control loop and uh, motor drivers running on the Arduino and all of the smart stuff happening back on the ROS node back at the base. And those guys communicating over Ethernet or Wi-Fi. Uh, and so putting the intelligence back on some remote machine. That's all I got. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Wes. Um, I have here a little Bobot that I've kind of modified, and uh, I'm going to go for the phase two challenge. Knock the can off the table, right? We have a paint sensor here that should detect the object, and we steer the robot towards the object. Once it detects the object, then it will work. Uh, it should detect the edges of the object so it can line up perfectly. Let's see if it works. It might be getting pulled by the fluorescence. Modulation of the fluorescence. Usually we claim batteries. Yeah, that's it. We're going to be the software, I know that. Just the light. Okay, so um, was it uh, November or so? The um, uh, some of the Google guys were showing off Cellbots, which is Python uh, Python-based uh, code running on a cell phone, an Android cell phone, controlling various robots. And so that got me kind of excited for doing something around that because Shiloh is learning to program in Python. And so anyway, I've been looking at uh, what's wrong. The wheel directions are backwards. Oh, just turn your turn yourself around. Okay, well, fine. <laughs> Anyway, well, well, move the wires around. I tore the robot apart earlier today, and when I plugged it together, I must have plugged in the wires in the wrong ports. But bad, daddy. But anyway, so so um, so anyway, this so that that was a couple of months ago, and it got me started down the path of looking for Android devices. So anyway, this Android device, of course, you know, I'm going to hold up the robot, so you can just just hold that up and show people what it looks like. That is a, that is a Arcos uh, 70. It's a seven-inch tablet. Okay, I'm going to set it down. And, and uh, we're just running a stock application from, from Lego that uses the accelerometer in there and uses Bluetooth to talk to this. But we've also been able to get, um, get Python scripting going on that. And uh, we're in the process of, uh, of uh, learning to program in Python and in Android to control a robot. And we have an XV11. And I have to say, I did let the XV11 clean half the house before voiding the warranty. <laughs> but... but <laughs> But anyway, the long-term plan is to get an Android phone mounted on an XV11 and, and all that. But this is, you know, on the way. When, and this is actually a kind of a nice size thing for programming with. And I found a little Bluetooth keyboard that uh, that you can use for for pumping in. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of the keys are in funky places. Yeah, but it's better than no keyboard at all. So anyway, that's about that's that's about it. We're kind of at the beginning stages of starting a new track here with Androids and and Python and so forth. So that's that's it.
very much. Thank you very much. I have two things to share. My name is Alan Fetterman. First is I've been studying Leonardo da Vinci, looking at his drawings, looking at his drawings, and then actually building the machines. And you might find, for those of you who've done this, sometimes if you build exactly from the drawing, the machine will not work at all. What I like about Leonardo da Vinci is you'll see a drawing of a trip hammer. Then you'll see a drawing of a worm gear. Then you'll see a machine that combines both to do something else. So he was doing object-oriented programming with modules 500 years ago, just that we didn't have that terminology. So uh, I'll demonstrate some of these uh, things. So uh, this is a uh, what's known as a file carver. So it combines a trip hammer and a, a translational screw. And I guess the purpose is to chop marks into a file. And then he had a drawing of a machine that he called a uh, screw duplicator or screw maker. And it's sort of a design for a, uh, you know, uh, predates the screw forming lathe. Uh, my materials do not permit cutting, but I have a pencil in there to duplicate the effect. So how this came about is I went to the Tech Museum and saw their uh, exhibit on da Vinci. And I was looking at all these mechanisms and saying, this really means something. I couldn't figure out. It was like that scene on uh, Close Encounters of Third Kind where he's scooping up potatoes and saying, this means something. Don't know what it means. Eventually, what I figured it out, the reciprocator mechanism that he uses to convert uh, continuous rotation into back and forth is basically the rocker bogey mechanism that you use to uh, level a Mars rover. It's just an inversion of that thing. So basically, anything we know that we need to solve mechanically has been done 500 years ago. And uh, we just need to go back to sort of reexamine that. Talking about RetroTech, uh, Camp uh, swapped me this for, I don't know, he probably got better at the deal. What did I give you? Fairly nice uh, uh, PWM module. Dennis Burke. Dennis Burke. OK, thank you. And uh, this is actually a working Hero 1. I'm not going to demonstrate it. But uh, it's kind of interesting. It does work. It talks. What does it have in it? It has locomotion. It has a rotation sensor on the wheel. It has several sensors, a sonar sensor, sonar ranging sensor, a infrared motion detector, a light detector, sound detector. It speaks. It interacts. It has an interface. And it actually has a, it has a serial interface, 9600 baud, 7-bit, odd parity, one-stop bit. <laughs> and since it's tokenized basic, if you try to use PuTTY, the characters are all in Cyrillic. So it's kind of interesting to attempt to program it. And uh, you don't have a program editor, so uh, you have to be a really good typist and really patient to get it to do things. So, uh, you know, uh, I think with just a little upgrade, we can put a Ross note on this, right? <laughs> it's a 6808 processor with, uh, I believe, 2K of memory. So no problem. A little upgrade to get Ross <laughs> on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. As you know, PR2 is very cool, but it's also very expensive. So Nathan has and his company have been kind enough to provide us with a Ross platform in disguise that costs only three orders of magnitude less than a PR2. <laughs> so what I have is a Neato XB11 vacuum cleaner. And give me one sec here. So what you see on your screen here is... So I'm, I've got the vacuum cleaner on the floor right now. And the vacuum cleaner is great because it's essentially a mobile base and a laser scanner in a box. And if you have a laser scanner, that means you have SLAM and navigation in a household environment or any other indoor environment. And it works really good. Uh, I was able to map my, I was able to use SLAM on a Neato using basically my laptop Neato and a USB cord to map my house. And now that my house is mapped, I can do navigation in my house. So I set my robot down in my in our foyer and I clicked on my room 
and it drove across the house, avoided obstacles, including the dog, and got to a, got to my room and turned into the right direction and stopped. And that is something uh, I'm really happy because that's something I've been trying to do basically a sen- since I got started in robotics. So for over five years, we've been trying to get something like that. And now we have that in a low-cost platform, at least relatively low-cost platform that you can get in your house. What you see, and I don't want to disrupt the current SLAM map-making process, so that's why I'm not going to pick the robot up and show it to you. I'll show it to you after the SLAM process. What you see on your screen right now is the the SLAM map that's in the progress of being created from the robot sitting behind the podium. So I'm going to drive the robot now, and we should see the map get expanded. And the tool that's on the background, if you see the maps turning now, that tool that's in the background is RViz, and it's a tool for visualizing ROS. Hang on a minute here. You don't have much yeah, yeah. cable. I'm, yeah, I'm aware. Uh, we're on a short lease of cords and cables right now. Um, take up the pace a bit here. And for those of you who do not know what SLAM stands for, it stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. Um, so you can see that that's the map on the screen turning on the right-hand side of the screen. And uh, in addition to doing localization, I can also do navigation. And I'll give you sort of a crude demo of navigation very quickly. Um, right now on the Internet, there's a driver for the Neato that you can download. And if you configure, you write a couple of configuration, which hopefully will be on the Internet soon as well, um, you'll have an out-of-the-box platform. You just plug it in and uh, install ROS and go. Um, you, of course, you do need Linux. What I did was I made a USB stick with Ubuntu on it and just installed ROS on that so I don't have to uh, install on my hard drive. Come on. Okay, so... So this is what nav- navigation looks like. It won't entirely work because it doesn't entirely know where it is. But if I make it go forward, it should go forward. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, cables. it'll be okay. It'll run over the queue. All right. So that's navigation. And if I zoom in here, what I see on the screen is uh, that's base laser link. That's a fixed map. Um, and that blue is the cost map around the robot. So if you put something behind the robot, hey, Wayne, can you step behind the robot? You can see Wayne, you should be able to see Wayne moving on the cost map. He's right at the back of the cost map there. That's Wayne. So, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's basically navigation. And if I clicked behind Wayne, it would avoid Wayne. This is what the robot looks like, just FYI if you didn't see the talk last week. My name is Andrew, and I've been coming here for maybe two years. So this is, I guess, one of my experiments with uh, RoboRealm, which is basically uh, a way to experiment with computer vision. They have just modules that you can use, like um, like fiducials, and you can do uh, I guess image processing using this program that comes for free by trial. Anyway, what I'm trying to experiment with is, uh, I guess, the fiducials, which are basically just patterns that are unique, and I tie them to different physical entities. Like this one, I'm making as the robot. This one is my ball, and this one's my goal. Uh, this, this is, is basically, basically a half table bot, bot challenge. challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my camera doesn't have that much space. Anyway, when it should run, I first have the robot like just look for a spot behind the ball that leads it all the way to the goal. So like this line over here, the robot should try going over here and then pushing the ball toward the goal for digital. Okay. Hopefully it's okay. okay. 
So one one of the biggest problems was trying to figure out how to get the robot to get behind it without hitting the ball while going straight to that point. And I determined that by finding the place behind the correct place behind the ball and two places 90 degrees away from that and figuring out to go to those first like as a waypoint then going to the place behind the ball so that you can hit. Thank you. That is seriously cool. Um, this is an example of, of, of the use of fiducials and uh, an inexpensive webcam. How much uh, position resolution do you get out of the fiducial? I mean, how, uh, the position of your robot, how, how accurately is that decoded from the fiducial? Um, like you within a centimeter or? Yeah, it's about within a centimeter. <laughs> I'm getting like half, half an inch with yeah. my, my fiducial at home. Okay, we're going to do John and John next.